Joining us right now to talk about this exciting journey is the state senator. Thanks for being here with us. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right. So let's jump right into it here because, you know, you'd been rumored to be running for several different offices this year. You never said or committed to anything really until now the race for New York three. Now this district with the newly drawn lines, it really does cover a lot of ground and a lot of people. So let's start here. Why did you ultimately decide that this was the right move for you, the right race for you? Well, first and foremost, um, I want everyone who is watching to understand and know that this is my home. Um, I actually represent the eastern part of the Bronx in this district, is in my state senate district that I currently serve in. Um, I live in Pelham, um, which is in Westchester County, um, and I have really spent um, really my entire life um, in whether it's Westchester or the Bronx or even in parts, other parts of New York City, like Queens or Long Island, where I also have family. Um, at, the, at the core of this is this is my home. And what is really motivating me to just take this plunge and to really take a stand for why I really think I'm the best candidate in this race um, is because when I really look around our world, I am watching a world with so many urgent issues and not nearly enough urgency in Congress. And so, you know, when we think about things like the climate crisis and gun violence, which is its own epidemic, um, our democracy, which is under a constant coordinated threat, Roe is about to be overturned. What it feels like is that so many members of Congress are acting like everything is normal. Um, and why that matters to me and to many people that I have spoken to is because they they are essentially creating the world that we all have to live in. And unfortunately, what is really frustrating is that a lot of leaders are afraid to use their power, but I am not. Just like I have done in Albany, I think that it is um, really important that you know you use the fullest extent of the power that you are given by the voters who elect you in the state Senate. I have successfully accomplished every single thing that I have ran on since I ran in 2018. Um, and that has really paved the way for what I know to be um, this road that, that proves that, that all of the things I just mentioned, climate, gun violence, uh, threats for our democracy, Roe being under threat are possible. And so in Congress, I will take that same energy, that same perseverance and relentlessness um, and use the full power of this office so that we can actually create the change that is needed right now that we, and I really believe we're not seeing. You know, you talked a little bit about it there. When you announced your candidacy, you really championed your achievements in Albany in one of the you know, most progressive legislative sessions that we saw in state history. How would that translate to Washington if you're elected? So, you know, when I ran for the state Senate in 2018, I ran because New York was really failing to live up to its highest potential. And that is because for so many years in Albany, there was this political gridlock because we had people running as Democrats, getting elected as Democrats, and then going to Albany and caucusing with Republicans, preventing so many of the things that we all care about from actually happening. And since the year that I unseated um, one of the most conservative Democrats in the history of the state, what, what you mentioned, which is true, is that we had one of the most prolific and progressive legislative sessions in the history of, forget about just New York State, in the history of all state legislatures across the country. We passed things like the Reproductive Health Act, which codified Roe v. Wade. We delivered on full funding for our New York schools, not just in New York City, across the entire state. We passed incredibly strong and also important gun safety laws, criminal justice reform, the most aggressive climate change law in the country. And so because we've made this progress in Albany, what I know to be true is that New York being the leader that it is, not only for the country, but for the world, is a place that proves what's possible. We did it in Albany. This can happen in Washington on the very same issues that I have mentioned on the national level. And that's exactly what I want to do. And so I think having the experience of really these four years of, of even though we have a supermajority, every single issue that we take on is like its own mini campaign and own set of fights that we have to engage in. Um, because I will just remind your viewers that we um, had a governor who was not always willing to work with the legislature. So there were a lot of challenges that we faced. And I think that there's a lot of similarities between really, unfortunately, what is being experienced in Washington, which is gridlock. And, and honestly, again, I can't underestimate there or really underemphasize this enough urgency. There's a lack of urgency. And I think we've all acted, I have acted with incredible urgency around all of the issues that we've worked on. 
Senator, you mentioned the new district here is home for you, but this new district also covers some wide areas, areas previously represented by Representative Tom Swazi. His ideas have tended to be more towards the middle, but there's also the areas that were previously represented by Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Jamal Bowman. Those are very progressive, more in line with some of your policies in Albany. How would you approach representing such a wide range of people if you get elected? Well, I already do. In District 34, <laughs> I represent a very wide range of ideologies, beliefs, and people. Um, I represent Westchester County, Pelham, and Mount Vernon, and then a very large portion of the Bronx, from the Northwest in Woodlawn and Riverdale, all the way on the East Bronx to City Island and Throgs Neck, including Hunts Point, including Rikers Island. And I intend to take the same approach that I did when I ran in 2018. And in my first race, really what's important, I think, to highlight here is that I ran against one of the most conservative Democrats in the state of New York. He had outspent my campaign 10 to one, and we won by almost 10 points. And I attribute a lot of that, of course, to the people powered movement and volunteers that we amassed. And also to the fact that I ran absolutely as myself and I plan to do exactly that in this race. I think more fundamentally, what's important, I think for you know my, my own thinking around um, a race and, and a district that has five counties in it, um, which of course there are different issues across all five counties, but there's a lot of similarities. And that's why I fundamentally try not to accept the frame of moderate versus progressive or conservative versus progressive, because I honestly know just from the work that I've done that the things that I've fought for and the things that I'm fighting for are the same policies that are popular amongst all New Yorkers. And so whether you're living in Long Island or the Bronx or Westchester or Queens, people all want a dignified life. They wanna live in a home that they can afford. They want good schools for their children. They want well-paying jobs. They wanna feel safe in their communities. They want guns off of their streets. They want climate change to be addressed and they want healthcare that they can afford, just to name a few. And so I think really at the end of the day, Voters really just want leaders who can deliver, who are not going to talk. Democrats do a lot of talking, but we need Democrats who are going to actually deliver. And so that's why, you know, as we, we've kind of like started in this race, one of the things that I have really focused on is that it's not just about electing more Democrats. It's, it's about electing better Democrats. Um, and so at the end of the day, I think that, you know, what really is underlining and underscoring this campaign and my candidacy in this race is that there, there are um, a lot of things that we have done in District 34 that are absolutely just like New York 3. And I intend to bring that same amount of hustle for every single person across this district. There are so many candidates already declared for this race. Most of them are from Long Island. So there's a lot of people who maybe don't know a lot about you. Hopefully, you know, we're hearing about that now. But what makes you stand out in this crowded field here from this, especially from this field of Democrats? Well, first of all, let me just phrase it um, very succinctly. Um, I think that what voters in New York 3 should vote for is a strong leader, a leader with integrity, a leader who knows how to build and use political power, who has navigated government, who has accomplished big wins, um, and who will use their voice in Congress to push for those things, just to make sure that we are doing better or differently for this country. Um, and I really believe and know that that is frankly, what sets me apart from the rest of the candidates in this race. I am the candidate with the most experience. Um, and even though this will also be a general, a, excuse me, a competitive general election, um, I really do believe that we should want and, and voters do want someone who has a track record of not only being a winner, which I am, but especially winning against a more conservative set of opponents, which again, I have done. I think right now in Washington, so many people are willing to distort facts based on their political positions, which is a very sad reality. Um, it's something that causes me to have a lot of heartache many days. Um, they're really focused on unfortunately the wrong thing, their political interests. And really where, where my candidacy and my just identity and leadership shifts from what we're seeing is that loyalty to your own political party what we're seeing is more important than protecting constituents back at home. And that has never been um, a stance that I have taken. And it's not to say that I'm not proud to be a Democrat. I sure am. I've been a Democrat since I was 18 years old and able to actually register to vote. But at the end of the day, I think what's really important is that I have proven that I am committed to being 
a leader that not only will not back down, um, but also puts truth and integrity over loyalty to a political party, because that is where there is a shortage in Washington. And that is, I think, what is most needed from our leaders if we want to actually lead into the future and to create the world that we all say that we want to be created. You spoke about leadership there. The previous leader of this district, Representative Swazi, he said he's not going to support your candidacy for this seat. He even went on to say that he's looking for people who are willing to work across party lines. I wonder what your response is to that. Do you feel as though you are able to work across party lines? So I don't think that um, the former rep or the current rep, because you know he still represents this district, um, has been really paying attention to my record because for the last three years in the state Senate, I think what I have proven the most is that not only can I deliver results for New Yorkers, whether it's again, expanding voting rights, passing climate reform, codifying Roe v. Wade, fully funding public schools, not only in District 34 that I represent, but in New York 3 where he represents, <laughs> making sure that we're actually providing tax relief for, for the middle class and middle class families. I have worked alongside all of my colleagues in the state Senate to deliver all of these big wins. and. Frankly, in Albany, Democrats have a supermajority, so it's not required to work across the aisle to pass legislation, but that doesn't mean that I haven't. And so as chair of the Ethics Committee, I have led many efforts to root out corruption in our government, which unfortunately, Albany is still notorious for being corrupt. I do think that we've made it a bit better um, and it's, it's trending in a better direction, but I've done those things and those things have been possible by partnering with Republicans to get the job done. And I think that ethics is a perfect place where we would hope that whether you're in the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, you could agree that you want your government to not have corruption and to have transparency be the thing that is leading versus what we've seen, unfortunately, throughout so many of our leaders in our government in Albany. One of the very first criticisms that was directed your way after you announced was your stance regarding police funding. Back in 2020, you had tweeted in support of defunding the police, but as we sit here right now in 2022, are you still in favor of defunding the police or do you feel as though there's a different approach to be taken to police and public safety? Well, first of all, thank you for bringing up this topic because I think sometimes um, it, is challenging to be able to have an honest and earnest and good faith conversation around police reform and accountability. What I know that we have to focus on is how best to help the police that we have and the force that we have deal with the rising violent crime. And at the same time, we can also reduce police brutality and that these things are not incompatible. Um, and I think that the defund phrase, unfortunately, um, really does prevent us from having that conversation. And so I've grown not to love the phrase, even though I understand wh what is behind it and, and the purpose of it. When we say defund the police, what do we mean? We mean focus resources on things that historically have been under resource that we know can actually solve for violence in the future. A lot of the conversation around gun violence and police reform and police brutality, unfortunately, is really focused on what happens after the gun goes off off instead of what happens before the gun goes off. And so I, of course, value the lives of our police officers. My own grandfather was a decorated police officer in, in the New York Police Department. He was one of the most decorated in the history of the department. Um, and that was something that was embedded in me as a young person because of his experience there and how that allowed him to lead later um, when he then decided to run for office. He was shot and stabbed 10, time, 10 times in the line of duty. And so we grown to have a reverence. But what my family has also taught me is that in order to be able to have systems that are accountable, we have to tell the truth. And so the reality is that police officers are tasked with ta with jobs and responsibilities that they should not be. They are expected to solve problems that are frankly beyond, I believe, what they signed up for this job to do. And so when we ask them to really focus on mental health issues, when we ask them to, you know, deal with the homelessness crisis, these are things that also prevent them from solving gun violence and other violent crimes like rape. And so what we do need to do is make sure that violent crimes are actually solved. I mentioned that just one sentence ago. And the reason for that is because I believe that that is what police officers are meant to do. Only 30% of shootings in New York City 
were solved last year and only 40 percent of rapes were solved in new york city in 2020. those rates need to be 100 percent we have to remove police from addressing mental health crises. We have to make sure that there are healthcare professionals with adequate training to make sure that every single school also has counselors that are accessible to students. I mean, these are common sense basic things, and yet we don't put our money there. We also need to make sure that we're removing police officers from enforcing things like traffic laws or, or you know, giving tickets for expired meters. They should be focusing on the most important ways that they can help to keep our communities safe. And I think that frankly, we also need to address the root causes of violence and public safety. And this includes looking at things like income inequality. It includes things like homelessness and the crisis surrounding those who are unhoused, expanding, again, expanding access to health care um, and to mental health care services. All of these things really are the whole picture. And unfortunately, when we talk about this issue, we are talking about it in such a narrow way that we're actually preventing our own selves from getting to the root cause of what is causing the gun violence epidemic as well as frankly the spikes in crime not just in new york but across the whole country it's an issue that needs to be addressed across the board as you mentioned right there another issue across the board and across this district you know we look at that map we see where the things are but one thing you notice it's all surrounded by water there's a lot of water there that has to be taken into account so the climate and the issues involving the climate definitely something that the next representative needs to pay attention to and deal with. In fact, we've seen in the past how even storms can impact these waterfront areas, massive flooding and damage, but it's much more than that when we talk about dealing with climate issues. So what would be your environmental agenda in DC? I'm so glad that you asked this question because what a lot of people don't know or realize is that I spent um, my early years as an attorney working in the governor's office of storm recovery to help New York rebuild after Hurricane Sandy, and that included a lot of the coastal communities that are in Long Island. And much of New York 3, this district, the coast, um, is really, you cannot ignore the climate crisis because if we don't address it, this will be a district that is almost six feet underwater if we don't act with urgency. And so some of the things that I am, and have prioritized in the state but will continue to prioritize at the federal level in dc is things like electrifying our entire grid and our and our entire system building a 100 percent zero carbon um, electricity grid making sure that we are exploring direct carbon capture to reverse things like the climate crisis. I mean, it means also investing billions of dollars and creating, you know, jobs as a result of it, but really thinking about, um, you know, hydropower, wind, solar, modern nuclear. We have to also invest heavily in ensuring that we're adapting to resiliency. Again, this is a coastal community. Not everybody in New York 3 lives on the water. We know that, but we also know that every single storm leads to really more um, challenging outcomes, worse flooding, um, deaths. We have homes that really, frankly, are not are not able to recover after you know even even the smaller kinds of storms because of the, because of the fierceness of them and because of how much damage they're doing. And so, making sure that we are weatherizing homes, building coastal infrastructure that actually protects us um, from these extreme storms is really, honestly, the the center the centerpiece of this campaign. I want to get through as many topics as I can in the time we've got left here. I want to talk a little bit about voting rights here. It's something I know that you're passionate about. Do you support the voting rights reforms that have yet to be passed in Congress? It is more election reform needed going forward. I absolutely do. Um, the voting reforms in Congress, including the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act, um, are two bills that I absolutely support, um, as well as reforming the Electoral Count Act. Um, and these are a whole set of issues, again, that have already been taken up in New York, um, but really we need to make sure that it's prioritized because you, at the end of the day, everything we've talked about here, whether it's climate or healthcare or gun violence, all of that will be almost impossible to problem solve around if we do not actually save our democracy, which is at risk. And so it's not hyperbolic to say that. And so I think that it's important that Washington have more Democrats that are ready and willing to make this one of the most important issues of not only their term, but frankly, for the next however many years it takes to defend against, unfortunately, a coordinated campaign to undermine our democracy. 
One of the many causes you fought for since day one in Albany has been women's rights. You've said right here on Power and Politics that they are human rights, not women's rights. You know, whether it's reproductive rights or protections for survivors of sexual abuse. Right now, though, in D.C., there's a lot of concern. You mentioned it earlier regarding abortion rights and, and the, what the Supreme Court may do. What are your thoughts on that battle? What should be done? Well, I will tell you that, you know, the fight for codifying Roe v. Wade was really one of the the motivating factors for what got me into my race in 2018. Um, and that is because the Reproductive Health Act, which would codify Roe v. Wade, which we did do, was being blocked by a group of very conservative Democrats who stood with Republicans and were frankly standing in the way of passing that bill. We're as you mentioned, many months away, although it seems like it's, you know, it inches closer and closer from this conservative majority Supreme Court overturning Roe, which was something that I used to say um, every single day on the campaign trial in 2018, that it's not a matter of if, but when Roe was overturned. And I frankly am um, really just alarmed at the speed at which Republicans have attempted to pull away this fundamental right um, and 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 really um, just ab annihilate, frankly, a woman's right to choose. And so in Congress, I will absolutely fight to codify Roe. Um, it will be really, I think, at the center again of what I will fight for. It's important that we do this at the federal level. I will just remind everyone that we have a Democratic majority um, in both the House and also the Senate, and we have a Democratic president. And so this is something that all Democrats should be really uh, not even fighting for, but prioritizing, because I don't think that if you are a Democrat, you have to be fighting for it. I think it's part of your values, but we have to be prioritizing it um, to make sure that we protect the right to an abortion for all Americans. We've spoken about a lot of issues here, but when regards to the East Bronx specifically in that area, are there any issues that you would make a priority in DC specifically for the people of the East Bronx? Yes. So, I mean, in addition to the issues that I mentioned previously, including climate change and voting rights and codifying Roe and public safety, um, the East Bronx is um, a place that I have been serving um, in for the past four years. And it has really shown me a, an, an entire range of issues that I think, frankly, resonate across not only just New York three, but I think across the whole state. Um, I am a millennial. I think our generation has experienced so many economic crises that it's almost hard to count them. Um, and, and frankly, hopefully we don't have to encounter more, but who knows what will be coming down the pike when it comes to our economy? We hope again that it will um, that it will continue to increase and improve and create jobs. But we are the generation that has unfortunately experienced one economic crisis after the other. Other, and so what we need to do is make sure that our young families actually have the ability to afford a home and also have a savings, which means having access to good, well-paying jobs, um, making sure that the, the child tax credit is actually permanent, um, passing universal child care, because this is part of an economic policy. If people can't have a place for their children to be taken care of, a lot of the times they leave the workforce. And a lot of the times that actually happens to be women. We've had a million women leave the workforce since COVID began. Um, making sure that we're focusing on things like raising the salt cap um, to help middle class and first time homeowners um, and, and building a larger and greater housing supply so that we can actually have the home prices be more affordable. One thing I will also say is that it is not ever lost on me. And I always wanna center this in my conversation when I talk about the Bronx, that the the Bronx has been the hardest hit when it comes to the pandemic, not just in New York City, not just in New York State, in the entire country. The Bronx has seen the highest COVID rates, the highest number of deaths, and that is not an accident. The Bronx has unfortunately been the result of a long series of uh, decades of underinvestment. And so when we think about why those Things are a lot of what I mentioned will help us to make sure that in the future, when we have future pandemics or future crises, that the Bronx is actually more prepared. But making sure that the Bronx has all of the things I mentioned, um, having those needs met is a crucial um, piece of my leadership. And it will continue to be if I am elected to New York three. All right, State Senator Biagi, lastly here as we get ready for this primary in just a few months, what's your message to voters here in this brand new district? Well, first of all, it's a privilege to even be able to run. And I wanted to say thank you to you and also um, to those who are watching for listening. Um, I 
want you all to know that I am a proven fighter um, and also a winner. I have the experience working in government for many years, championing legislation, and also delivering those results for New Yorkers. And so no matter how you identify yourself politically or how you vote, I am absolutely unwavering in my loyalty to the people that I represent, not to political parties or to power structures, to the people. And that will not ever change. I also want to just end by saying that it's important that our next member of Congress in New York 3 know how to build and use political power so that we can get all of the things I mentioned done because they matter to all of us. And I think I've shown that in the state Senate and I'm ready to do that in Washington as well.